welcome to the Dr. Frankavilla Show. I'm your host, Dr. Carolyn Frankavilla, board certified family physician and diplomate with the American Board of Obesity Medicine. I've been helping patients lose weight to treat and prevent medical problems for the last 10 years, and I'm taking what I've learned from them to you. In this podcast, you will learn the science behind why you struggle with your weight and what to do about it, tips for common challenges, work to fight bias about what a healthy weight really is, and improve your relationship with food and your body. Please remember that while I'm a doctor, I'm not your doctor. This podcast is meant to be informational in nature only, not medical advice. Please seek out care from your physician for your specific needs. Okay, let's get started. And welcome to this episode of the podcast. Today, I have a guest with us. This is Dr. Sylvia Donzenbole, and she is another obesity specialist. She's an integrative obesity specialist, best-selling author, and founder of Embrace You Weight and Wellness. Dr. Bully works with individuals and organizations to transform evidence-based medicine into personalized solutions. She wrote the bestseller, Embrace You, Your Guide to Transforming Weight Loss Misconceptions into Lifelong Wellness. She's a passionate speaker. She speaks at our OMA conferences. She created the Black Health Obesity Webinar Series, and she currently hosts a show on blackdoctor.org. She is an expert reviewer for Live Strong. She's on the ACP Obesity Advisory Committee, and she's on our OMA Board of Trustees with me. So she is just doing everything. And she also resides in the DC area with her husband and children. So I am super excited to have her on the episode today because we are going to talk about BMI, the body mass index. Yeah. Yeah. She's making faces already, which has always sort of had a lot of controversy around it, but has come up a lot more again, partly because the American Medical Association, which I was there for this meeting, sort of voted to say like, we don't think the BMI is the best and like, let's start moving away from it. So super exciting. And that is what we're going to talk about today. Dr. Bully, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in all of this? Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. Always great to be in the midst of another great obesity physician, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So my background is I started out in traditional internal medicine, but what really got me interested, I think started long before. I'm first-generation American. My parents are from Liberia, West Africa, born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, right? So it's a restaurant here. So I grew up oscillating between diet culture and like really heavy, rich Southern cuisine and really worried about gaining weight because I saw my grandmother die to complications of obesity. So she had diabetes, hypertension, had a massive stroke. And so I would go between like overindulging and under eating, overindulging, under eating, like back and forth thinking that was healthy, right? Back then in that diet culture. Once I had my baby, I gained 60 pounds, had preeclampsia, and then kept 40 of it on. I was already a doctor. I was in residency, went back to chief year, chief resident year, and it was so stressful. And I coped the best way I knew how, which was emotional eating. And so I like to say I kept 40 pounds of baby weight on for two years because of a combination of stress, sleep deprivation, and my drug of choice, cheap pizza. So when I finally decided that I just felt heavy mentally, physically, emotionally, I got to get this weight off, I tried to do what we learned in med school, which was calories in, calories out, and it didn't work. Yep. So that was like my key. And again, being a very spiritual person, I've also been a Christian leader since age 13. I felt like God was like, I'm not going to let you make a positive change with a negative mindset. And so you need to learn to embrace and love yourself with the 40 extra pounds on wherever you are now, and then the solutions will come. I love that so much. And I talk about this on this episode, like it cannot be about obsessing about numbers or body image or those things. It has to be about health, right? And taking care of your body. And so I think I love your concept of embrace you, right? This is not about you being wrong or bad or your body being bad or any of that. It's about health and living your best life in your body. And we can do that at all different weights, right? 
Yes, I love that. And we'll talk later. Like I have philosophy too, the difference between toxic weight loss, cosmetic weight loss, and then health related weight management. Those are different things, which we're not talking about. So once I got to the point that I could embrace and love myself, then I realized, oh, I need more tools. I need more knowledge because what we learn calories in calories out, like obesity wasn't even a disease. When I graduate med school, I graduate 2010 and we didn't even learn about it as a disease process. So I then got, went to the OMA, started taking the courses, got boarded by the American Board of Obesity Medicine, started practicing 50, I was in primary care at the time, so practiced about 40, 60 obesity medicine, internal medicine, and then eventually opened up my own thing while working on the COVID front lines. And the rest is kind of history and been incorporating some longevity practices, pers- precision medicine, and really figuring out how to personalize obesity care from one size fits all to the level of the individual. Yeah, that resonates with me. I struggle sometimes and it took me a really long time to start making this podcast because Mm -hmm. everything I do is so individualized. And so I was like, well, how do I make my message more broad, right? Because I don't want to mislead people that there's a right way to eat or a right medication or a right mindset. All those things are really individualized. So it took me a really long time to feel like my voice was clear enough on all this that that I wasn't leading people astray because it is so personalized and about those goals. Like, I've been joking with my patients lately. One of my questions in my intake should be, how long do you want to live, right? When you mentioned the longevity part, right? If you only want to make it to 65, like my job's a lot easier than if you're trying to live to 95 and still be able to hike two miles at a time, right? So all those goals are really individual of what are you trying to accomplish with your health? Yeah, I love that approach. And the thing is, and as we'll talk about while there, you're right. While it's so personalized and individualized, there's a few things I think we can do better in medicine and in healthcare to start with broad terms and then whittle it down to that level of the individual, especially when we're talking about outdated tools like the standard BMI. Okay, so one more comment on what you said, because you said a bunch already, which (laughs) I had no idea. You also grew up in a family of restaurateurs. So I also am from a restaurant family. And sometimes I joke with my patients that I partly know that weight is biologic because there's really not a lot of good reasons why I didn't struggle with my weight, right? I Mm -hmm. ate a lot of really heavy food. I ate a ton of ice cream. I ate a lot of fast food in high school and I did like healthy food as well. And I did always move a lot, but looking back, I'm like, no, 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 it was more, there's a biologic component as well, because I certainly didn't grow up eating nothing but vegetables and fruit, right? I ate plenty of food that was not health food, right? There's nothing wrong with that food. And I think we've blamed food sometimes too much. Yeah. And I love that you said that. And I think this makes us kind of better doctors in a way too, because then you understand the pull that food can have and people's relationship with food. And I mean, really for me, losing that 40 pound and and keeping it off for the most part for the past eight years has been transforming my relationship with food and not just seeing it as like a stress reliever or a celebratory thing, like just really changing that. Okay, I see a future podcast episode (laughs) in our future on relationship with food. But today I want to talk about BMI, which I kind of consider you an expert on. I mean, this is a topic you speak on a lot. You know a lot about the history of it. So can you give us some of the high points of like BMI, where it came from, why it's kind of controversial, why it's not that great of a tool? Yeah. So for people who may be new, BMI, we're talking about body mass index. And this is basically a calculation where we take your height, your weight in kilograms or pounds, but you're in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. And then it's put on a standardized chart. And then we look at that chart and how it's been used. You look at that chart and then decide, are you at risk for um, adipose related disease or at risk for obesity. But how people have come to use it is they look at that chart and say, you have obesity, right? So what many people fail to realize is does that standardized chart that is in most offices is not the only one. And we know now that you need to be able to, if you're going to use this as a starting point for screening for obesity, not diagnosis, but screening for obesity, you need to make sure that it's adjusted for age, for biologic sex, 
for muscle composition, for body composition or muscle composition, for ethnicity and race as well. And then for the presence or absence of other metabolic or, or obesity related conditions. So the most common ones being high blood pressure or hypertension, hypercholesterolemia or high cholesterol, non-insulin dependent diabetes or type two by diabetes. So for you looking, if you have those factors and then there's different charts that you can use as a screening tool because the original tool did not take into account any of these factors and was created its origin is from 1832 in belgium which many of us don't look like belgian men from 1832 and we don't have the same body habitus so it's so important to take these other factors into account yeah, it's so interesting because it is this number that was, gosh, how many years ago is that? Like um, hundreds of years old, basically, at this point. And it was just a ratio, right? It wasn't like scientifically determined. It was just kind of created as a cutoff point. And we do that in medicine all the time. I imagine that you have the same challenge with blood sugar, right? At 6.5, your A1C is diabetes. And at 7, it's uncontrolled. And that's not really looking at the individual person, right? We're seeing that challenge more and more. Well, what makes sense for this person, right? And so, yeah, BMI is just one of these other many numbers of cutoff we have in medicine where it's just a number. Like, it gives us a direction. I and mean, there's ways we can improve that number, like you said, by taking taking into account lots of other factors that we know are more important. So like I've said a couple of times, BMI has get, gotten more controversial, I feel like, recently. We used to just accept it. But as we have talked more and more about helping people with weight, you know, people are like, well, BMI is the number we use. Is it a good number? And what's not great about it? So what are some of those controversies or things that really make it a more concerning number, maybe even at times? Yeah. So the concerning part is that in certain populations, it's going to either overestimate the risk of obesity or metabolic related diseases from obesity. So first and foremost, what I want to say is the purpose of this tool to go back to the point of your podcast, like we're not looking at this for beauty, for cultural norms, like any of these things, like we are looking at it from a health perspective. So the whole yes. question when we're using the body mass index in the first point, is it giving us accurate information for the health of that individual? So the first and foremost, the number one thing is that body mass index was created as a population-based tool. It's looking at a group of people, right? And saying, okay, for this particular height, the average expected weight for people who do not have increased risk for heart disease or cardiovascular disease or diabetes, metabolic syndrome, these other things, the average weight at that height is this range of numbers. But it's not necessarily, it falls apart when you start to look at the individual and say, okay, for you, Carolyn, or for me, Sylvia, like, this is what you need to weigh. So what we should be doing is like looking at it as a cutoff point. And that's kind of how I use it in clinical medicine. Like, okay, when I see that a person at this height, at the upper limit is here, then I need to be doing additional screening for looking at those factors. Okay. Because based on their age, like again, then, so the two main things is a population-based tool. Number two, is that it doesn't take into account body composition and it certainly yeah. doesn't take into account lifestyle factors. And then because it doesn't do these two things, that's why we see the breakdown with ethnicity, with biological sex or hormonal driven factors. So that's why it's not a great tool once we're looking at specific factors like that. Yeah. And I see a fair amount of patients in my practice who they actually are under 25, which is that cutoff for overweight on the BMI chart. But when I get their bioimpedance, when I look at what their body fat percentage is, and when I look at their waist circumference, and when I look at their blood work, you know, they clinically have metabolic syndrome, they clinically have obesity. And so they would benefit likely from at least some weight loss and working on nutrition and things like that and exercise. But on that chart, they'd be missed, right? If all we were looking at was that cutoff, because technically they're in normal weight, but their way their body is responding to it and their body composition, their muscle mass versus body fat is not in a healthy place. 
And then vice versa, I'm sure you see this all the time. I have people who come in with a BMI of like 31, 32, you know, they feel terrible about themselves because every time they look it up or they do a calculation, it says they have obesity and that they need to do something, but they're hiking an hour every day. They're like lifting weights. Their blood work's beautiful. They feel good other than they feel terrible because a chart keeps telling them that something's wrong with their weight. Yeah, no. And I love how you balance this conversation because again, that's one of the things that's been missed. So you talked about AMA, American Medical Association, or even CMS, Center for Medicaid and Medicare, right? When they created the screening guidelines for BMI, it also took into account underweight and not just overweight. And so again, the influence of weight bias, we always focus on that larger body size or the upper limit, but you're right. right. What about the health of people that may not have obesity based on like just total absolute body weight or the BMI, but they also are exhibiting the same metabolic risk factors. Yeah. Even though they're again, in that normal zone. And then we actually don't talk about the sort of underweight category very Mm -hmm. much. Um, But I was telling a patient just last Friday when I was in clinic that when I see someone who really is at that low BMI, 18, 19, it's technically normal, but it's really at that low end. I'm always sort of as a family physician, what's wrong with this person, right? Because I know it is so hard to maintain weight in today's world that I'm like, do they have a digestive issue? Like what is going on? Do they not absorb well? Like why is their BMI so low? Because it's really so easy for us to gain weight in the modern world that again, when I see those really low ones, I'm like, is there some other health issue going on here that keeping that BMI in such a low place. I love that. Yeah, I wrote an article for Medscape, a very similar talking about that, like how weight bias isn't just rude, it's dangerous in the clinical practice because more of us need to, rather than just congratulating someone on weight loss, we have to look at what's the story behind that weight loss, because there are a lot of secondary causes of weight loss. There's a reason why there's an ICD-10 code, right, for that, like abnormal weight loss, unintentional weight loss, like our body's predisposition is to store fat. All right, girl, we're getting like so off track. This is all great. This is all great. Okay. Okay, so I think the next thing we're talking about, I think we both agree that weight has an impact on health, right? Um, In lots of different ways. So what is a better way for someone who's listening to figure out if their weight or their BMI really is in a bad place, right? If it is something that needs to be addressed or not, how can someone kind of figure that out? Yeah, well, great. I was happy you asked that. So this is one of my passion topics and how I approach all my patients and embrace you. And I wrote about it in the book as well. I think about weight in two entities, happy weight and healthy weight. Okay. Happy weight, that is feeling. Only you can decide your happy weight. Sure, there's a lot of influences from media, your background, your experiences, the culture, all of that, but you decide your happy weight. So when you come to the doctor, we're not telling you about your happy weight. We're talking about healthy weight. Healthy weight, this has is not just the BMI. It has four factors in it. So I look at the specific adjusted body mass index. So using these charts. So in the book, I have a few charts, but you can find them also online. So Fatima Cody Stanford, who's like a titan in modern day obesity research. She's also my friend. She's amazing. So anyway, she and her group proposed a adjusted BMI chart based on race, biological sex, and also the presence or absence of certain obesity-related comorbidities. So they looked at diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and then or two or more risk factors. And so you can use this chart to see where your cutoff might be based on these factors. Then there's another group based out in England, Neville's group, who did one based on age and biological sex as well, because we know that people, younger people tend to have more muscle mass, so they should have a higher cutoff for the threshold for obesity. And then older people tend to have more body fat at a lower BMI. So that's what that chart showed. So I would use this specific adjusted chart Then the other thing, looking at body fat percentage, which you mentioned, which is different cutoffs for obesity based on male or female, then looking at waist circumference, so where that is as well, 
And then looking at, do you have any of these metabolic or what we call obesity related health factors? So even though you're quote unquote normal weight, do you have uncontrolled type two diabetes? Do you have uncontrolled hypertension? Other things that we might indicate that your body may need to lose some excess adiposity. And then last but not least is your lifestyle. How are you living? Like, are you active? Are you getting the recommended amount of exercise, eating the right types of foods that nourish your body, stress management, good community support, all of those things. So that total package is what I look at and what I think we all need to look at when it comes to finding healthy weight for an individual. And knowing too, because people like numbers, I know I said all that and like fluff, 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 give me some numbers, Doc. So if people like numbers, knowing that your happy, healthy weight is a range just like the chart is. So usually it's going to be about a 10, 10 to 15 pound range. It's a range. And I like to say, it's like the range that you can still fit your clothes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, right. Have to lose, right. I think it's really important to just be aware of that. So I have a podcast. I'm sorry. I talk about the scale and improving your relationship with the scale. Like you just think yeah. of it as a number. It's not bad. It's not good. It's just that check-in. And I always like to think that I maintain my weight pretty easily, but like a year ago, my scale was broken. It really just was out of battery. It wasn't even broken. I didn't weigh myself for like six months. And finally I got on it and I, I was out of my happy weight. I was like, this is <laughs> the highest weight I've really seen for myself as an adult. And I was like, well, I guess checking in on that weight actually made a difference, right? Like if I wasn't aware of it, you know, I actually gained weight. And so it is being aware of that to some degree. It doesn't mean stressing about it, feeling bad, but like, you're like, if my pants don't fit or I'm at this number on the scale that the higher than I've ever seen before, that's just a time to reflect, right? And be like, okay, like, am I eating more sweets than I normally did? Am I moving as much? Like what's going on? Or did I start weight training? It's all muscle, right? And I need to just like not worry about the scale, but I think just being aware and then knowing there's going to be that fluctuation. People don't weigh the exact same amount every day. Sometimes you have a big poop. Sometimes you have water weight. Sometimes we go through phases of our life where we have more or less muscle or more or less fat. And like, that's kind of okay too. Yeah, I love that. And so same thing. So I teach like the scale is just data, right? And yeah, yeah. just data, there's no judgment. It's not good. It's not bad. It's data it, so that you can know. And then you're right. What level of accountability do you want to use? Like for me, and we're both runners, right? So I know I don't use a lot of scale data, but I know two things. If I'm running and I feel a lot of jiggle and wiggle and like my person, like my mileage is like, getting longer and my time is going down or I'm like, okay, I can tell I'm not at my happy or healthy weight anymore. And then the other thing is my clothes. So I have one dress that I've pretty much kept all through this journey for the past eight years. I got it when I was three months pregnant with my daughter and, oh, it couldn't be then. So I've had it for a, a long time though on this journey. And if that dress starts getting tight, then I'm like, okay, I know that I'm not at my happy or healthy weight anymore. So I think finding what works for you and what periodicity you want to use scale data is important. It can be important depending on what your goals are and your history. Not to underestimate, a lot of people People have scale trauma. Like I'm just yes. that a thing, right? This diet trauma. So like you may need that separation and to find other factors for data instead. You and I are from different parts of the country. Other than growing up in restaurant families, I think we have fairly different backgrounds in a lot of ways. And we practice in different parts of the country. But I see in sort of my peer group as well as my patients. There's not a lot of people who have a happy weight. Most mm -hmm. of the people I see are pretty obsessed with getting to a specific number on the scale. Sometimes it's a number they've never even been to or that they haven't been at in 20 or 30 years or that number on the BMI chart where they're really like, but it says, you know, I actually see a lot of doctors right now as patients. Okay, but like I need to be under 25, right? Like that's yeah. normal, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you help people work through that and like reevaluate what their happy weight is? Because I find it's really challenging for me to help my patients find a place where they're happy about their weight. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I thought a lot through. So chapter three of the book, every chapter of the book starts with the mindset shift, and then it has an empowerment tool, which is essentially like a worksheet. I'm a nerd, right? So we so we kind of work through a stepwise process of thinking about, okay, if you have a happy weight, what is that number? And then walking through, well, are you deciding that number or is it from like 
you someone told you you need to weigh that or is it public perception of how much you need to weigh i mean we cannot overemphasize the culture to your point you i think you're so you're in like the colorado area yeah i am like like very yeah. white suburban like exactly yeah. so i'm in, in a black urban area i mean it's still pretty mixed but i work with a lot of black women i do a lot of work in the black community we actually have the opposite problem you can see this in the data where because in our culture curves are celebrated and normalized a lot of people tend to underestimate what they weigh and they're very comfortable in their weight. So actually I just did a community. I had a grant to do a wellness outreach program here in the county. And what we did was a culturally tailored obesity education program, but we did not use weight as an outcome because I know sometimes when I even come and talk about healthy weight, like whoop, <laughs> blinders up, right? In my community. So I was like, okay, you've been told by a doctor you need to lose weight, maybe you agree or disagree. Let's just set lifestyle goals based on it. And I'm going to help you come up with your how you can reach your smarter goal. So I think that for that population, it's very different what you're looking, what you're looking for. But I do work with a fair amount of white women as well, busy professionals. And a lot of it, I think we all suffer from weight bias from sexism, but in different ways, right? I think the pressure as a white woman to be ultra thin, I mean, if you go as far back like Twiggy from the 1960s and things like that, it's there. So it's working through people. I've helped a lot of people successfully get to the point where they're comfortable with, well, this is how my body works, how it, can, it holds weight and it's okay. I'm not going to base my happiness on what someone else's perception of happiness is being projected on me. But it does take time and it may not even just be a conversation with one doctor. I work with interdisciplinary teams, like I said, I'm integrative. So sometimes it takes therapy because there's deep-seated trauma. If you look at the work of Dr. Folletti, right, with the adverse childhood events, yeah. like the role of trauma and obesity. So it takes working through the trauma. It may take working with, I've done even had people see an EFT, emotional freedom technique, like just dealing with the emotions around it. That has been very helpful. So really get into the core root of where the unhappy weight, we could call it, is coming from so that you can truly hear what makes you happy. And so I think kind of the take home from that is whether you like your weight where it's at and someone else is saying health wise, you might have a benefit or the flip side, you don't like your weight, but maybe you don't have a health reason that you need to lose weight. Some of it is dealing with where did that come from, right? Like, and then reframing it to a health goal. So is this the ideal from your family? I see a lot of people who were pushed a certain way by their family with this media, social media. I mean, I think this all came way before social media for most people. Or is it like just getting tied to a number? It's amazing to me how people just get obsessed with that BMI chart or a number they were once at where they were like, yeah, but when I was 20, I was 140 pounds. Like, okay, but you're 45 now. So like most of us are not going to have the same bodies we did when we were 20 in lots of different ways. There's a lot of things I remind people like that too. Do you really want to be 20 again in other ways too? Like emotionally, <laughs> like economically, like right. I don't ever want to eat ramen noodles again. Yeah, I'm going to say that. Like that, there was a lot of that going on when I was 20. So like we have changed and it's, it's just crazy again because again, the influence of weight bias, how we can change and evolve in so many different ways, but we just get fixated that no, our bodies need to stay this exact yeah. same way forever. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you and I could probably talk all day, but <laughs> as we are wrapping up here, is there anything that you felt like you wanted to say on this topic or any final thoughts that you want to make sure you share? Yeah, I think I really want to empower people to remember that when we talk about weight loss versus your health, gain or what you're trying to do that is very different things i'm seeing you and i were talking about like with these wonderful new medications we're excited like as obesity physicians about the tools that are available to our patients but that they're being abused right so not to make sure that people are not buying into toxic weight loss culture with which i define as weight loss at all costs without even thinking about your health if you decide that you want, there's a difference between toxic weight loss culture and then there's cosmetic, like you just want to be tight and right for whatever reason, you know, we're going to let you do you, embrace you. But that's different from what we're doing when we're really trying to help people reach their health goals as 
certified physicians and using these tools in the way that they were intended, which was to make sure that you can reduce your risk of all the complications of obesity or having excess body fat, and that you can live the longest, most satisfying, happy, healthy life possible. So I just want to remind you, be very clear about what your goals are so that people don't mislead you in these streets, <laughs> these weight loss streets, and, and that you, because we're going to see the long-term side effects of this too, with this abuse of these medications and even just of foods, detoxes, all these things. So getting really clear and really remember Remember, at the end of the day, you're an expert in your body. We are joining you in partnership to give you the right tools. So I love it. We have so many similar philosophies. I always say that. I'm like, <laughs> you know your body best. I'm like, you live in it 24 seven. So know it best, right? So I love it so much. Thank you so much. Okay. So if people want to connect with you, they want to find your resources. Clearly you are a huge wealth of information. What's the best place for them to find you or connect? Yeah, best places to get, head over to my website, Embrace You, Y-O-U, weightloss.com. And you can find a wealth that you can find out how to get the book. You can also get on my email community. We have a Facebook group and can connect with you there. So head over to my website, Embrace You, weightloss.com. And then I'm on all social media at Embrace You, MD. Awesome. Thank you so much. I will make sure that stuff's in the show notes too. And thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for what you're doing and being a voice of reason in the sea of all of this. <laughs> thank awesome. you. Okay. Until next week, take care. Thank you for listening to the Dr. Frank Avila show, where we learn about all things related to weight and health. If you love this podcast, make sure to leave those five-star reviews and share this podcast with a friend or loved one. If you have a topic about weight and health you want me to tackle, head over to the website, thedrfrankavillashow.com to submit your question. And make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss next week's episode. Take care.